I am so glad you convinced me that the family car should be the Defender 110. It is so beautiful inside. It's so comfortable. And it just feels indestructible. Yes, it really is. I've been waiting a long time for the new model to come out. The Defender 110, I'm telling you, it's my favorite car of all times. It's my third one. You know, I have stories of going off road. The guy managed the group. He was like, what are you doing in this beautiful car? I'm like, I'm going off road. He's like, are you sure? Because you can use one of ours. And then they look like Mad Max cars. I'm like, no, 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 no. We're going to do this. And he was shocked. Wow. Well, it's great because the Defender has been reimagined for 21st century adventure and its unparalleled off-road ability as well as its robust interior are invaluable whether you're headed towards uncharted territory or just a weekend of exploration. The Defender 110 tackles challenging surroundings with absolute confidence. The SUV conveys strength outside and in, featuring peerless technology like an intuitive driver display and an award-winning infotainment system. That's my favorite part, to keep you connected no matter where the journey takes you. Adventure is unique to everyone, and so is the Defender. Choose from the two-door Defender 90, the four-door Defender 110, or the larger Defender 130 with the ability to seat up to eight passengers. You'll find uncompromising performance in all three. So pack up and go even further with the Defender 110. Learn more at LandRoverUSA.com forward slash Defender. Capella University is rethinking higher education. With its game-changing FlexPath learning format, you can earn your degree on your schedule and fit your education seamlessly into your life. Imagine your future differently at capella.edu. This isn't your average business podcast, and he's not your average host. This is the James Altucher Show on the Choose Yourself Network. Today on the James Altucher Show. I remember I I always talk to the top CIA guys when I'm I'm writing a new thriller, and I always want to know the newest tricks to use in the books. And And, 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 sorry if I interrupt, but every now and then I don't understand. So when you say, when I'm writing a new book, I talk to the top CIA guys, not everyone can say that. So do you just say, oh, I'm going to write a book and I need to know something. And you call like the director of the CIA or well, what happens? At this point, you know, I'm doing this 20 years. And I remember my first Secret Service guy I ever approached, I thought he's never going to help me. The word secret's in the title. He's not going to tell me anything. And I sat down in his office. I can still remember it like yesterday. And I sat down and I figured he's going to just blow me off. And he said, Brad, I just want you to know I read your first book, The 10th Justice. I liked it a lot. And I want to help you with this one. And that was it. He just liked the book. I entertained well, what did him. you ask him? What did you want to know? Um, I wanted to know. Well, at that point, it was the first one. I wanted to know everything. I was like, is there a secret tunnel below the White House? Is there, you know, how do you get the president out? Where do you go? Where are the safe rooms? What are the things like? What? But, you know, but they've, they've been, you know, when we, we revealed a couple of years ago that Ronald Reagan carried a gun. And the Secret Service gave me that detail. I was in Secret Service headquarters. The guy's like, you want to hear a cool story? And the Secret Service says, you want to hear a cool story? The answer is, what do you say? Of course. Yes, I want to hear your cool story. And they were the ones who let us, you know, reveal that, which very few people knew. And I love that there are people who trust us to put these stories out there. All right, Jay, you tell me when. Brad Meltzer, welcome back to the podcast. Good to see you, my friend. For those who don't know, I'll do, uh, it's kind of, I don't even know where to start on the intro. You've written... 11 best-selling thriller novels. You've written for comics, comic books. You wrote, uh, you wrote Green Arrow, Just League of America. What else in comics? Uh, Identity Crisis, Buffy the Vampire Slayer, Action Comics, Superman, Batman. You've written for comic books. Uh, you've you've done television shows. Um, you, you know, History Channel's uh, Lost History. And Decoded. Where you, you, uh, uh, you found the, 9/11, the famous 9-11 flag in the photo. And uh, you had a bunch of uh, shows in there. I didn't, I you know, they were they were aired in 2015, but did you find Hitler's photo album? We did find Hitler's photo album. That what was, was in it? Well, um, why did he keep I know everyone wants album? it to be like filled with porn and like bad stuff. Um, but what no, we wanted to do- No, it would be more weird if it was just like little flowers. And- yeah, well, I actually went, it's funny, I went to see his paintings and that's what they are. They're little flowers, which is totally, you know, we have all of his paintings. We stole them. The US government, when we invaded, we took all of his art. And um, and I went to see it in this private warehouse that's on, in a base in Virginia and Fort Belvoir. And is it like one of those warehouses like at the end of Raiders of the Lost I, Ark? They, the funny thing is they call it the warehouse at the end of Raiders of the Lost Ark because it looks like it. Mm-hmm. It totally looks like it. Um, it's a big, long thing. And they had me like posing with a crate. And I was like, 
okay, brothers, show me where the ark is. And you know, and you, cause you, that's what you want. Hey. I wish it was as sexy as that. Um, they, it was in like a beautiful, nice place. But the fascinating part is the Hitler had this giant picture made of himself. He's on a horse. He's like, you know, they, he, it was kind of like if you were a king and you said, make me look kingly. This is what Hitler did. And he had this painting and portrait made of himself. And when the, um, when the Allied forces came in and took it out of Germany, the Allied troops at the time, the American troops punched holes in his face. And so it's this beautiful, I mean, not for what the content is, but it's, you know, someone took the time and made this painting that's supposed to be beautiful. And someone punched a hole in the face, which is exactly what you want to happen to bad Nazis like Adolf Hitler. And, um, but it's odd because you've never seen like a classic photo, you know, classic painting with a giant hole punch in it. And it's like this, amazing, beautiful metaphor for what happened, you know, in this disaster. And what I don't understand is, like, is is the American government essentially a hoarder? Like, why do we even care about having Hitler's photo album? Yeah, I, listen, I'm okay with that. I want to have, I mean, if you don't have Hitler's photo album, it's basically going to be used as propaganda by some other country who's going to be like, you know, put it up on a pedestal and whatever. And and I, I'm i okay with us having it. I like that. And I'm okay with us being hoarders too. Like, well, what why, do do I, why do you want to give it to some rich guy who's going to put it in there? You know, we can give it to, there's so many things that are owned by really wealthy people that are just taken off the market and they're in someone's bedroom. And I find that horrible. Like that stuff belongs in a museum. Like well, don't, we, you know, we, like like David Rubenstein we yeah, were talking we, about, right? It's like to, bought, bought the Magna Carta and could have hung it in his bathroom. And instead- Gave it to the National Archives. Said you and guys the Declaration have it. of Independence. And the, I mean, it's been you know, if I bought the Magna Carta, I'd you know, I feel like I might be more selfish. But God bless him for saying this is this belongs in a museum as where it should be. So I'm well, okay with us hoarding that. Th this is eventually going to segue into your your most recent book, uh, the first conspiracy, the secret plot to kill George Washington, which is a history book. Uh, but almost written like in a thriller-like style. Yeah, it's my first nonfiction book um, that I found almost a decade ago. I found the story in a footnote, which is where all the best stories are. And this footnote, I remember reading it, said that there was a secret plot to kill George Washington. And I'm like, is this true? Is this nonsense? Is this something on the internet? And, um, and it was true. In 1776, uh, there was a loyalist British plot to kill George Washington. When George Washington found out about it, he gathered those responsible. He built a gallows and he hung them in front of 20,000 people, the largest public execution at that point in North American history. George Washington brought the hammer down, was like, do not mess with me. I am George Washington. I'm going to be on the money one day. Um, and that's a, that's me paraphrasing. That's not a direct quote, but um, <laughs> but it was an incredible story. And I, and I said, you know, how am I going to figure this out? Like, how do I find out what the story is? I went to a Pulitzer Prize winning author, uh, Joseph Ellis, who wrote yeah, one of the wrote. great biographies of George Washington. And I said to him, you know, do you know the story, this plot to kill George Washington? And he said to me, I know the story. He's like, there's no modern book written about it. So you, you have your work cut out for you. And he said to me, um, here's the thing. He said, it's a story that involves Washington's spies. That's how they figured out the plot. So you can, fi I remember, I'll never forget sitting on the phone with him. And he said, you can figure out exactly how many slaves George Washington owned. You'll never figure out all of his spies. And so by its nature, what you're searching for, Brad, is going to be forever elusive. And he said, and well, you, you should do it. He said, try. He's like, the best you get a book, the worst you, you have an adventure. You make the point that uh, the way he set up his not, his spy system and his counterintelligence uh, system is basically survives to the present day. And, uh, you know, it kind of was the basis of the CIA and other intelligence. Yeah, it's factions. amazing what happens. I mean, you know, we think of, uh, George Washington back then, and I didn't know this part of the story, had his own personal bodyguards. And, and Josh Mensch, who I worked on Lost History with, he came in and we did this together and we went down the rabbit hole. And um, what Josh and I were going through it, one of the things he found was he had his own personal bodyguards, George Washington. He asked all of his regiments for their four best men. He said, give me your four best ones. He wanted drilled men, which means the best of the best. He narrowed it down personally, picked out the top 50, about 50 or so, and those became his personal guards. They called them the, the commander's guards. They eventually, you know, they had other names that it was like the general's guards, but the name that stuck with them was the lifeguards because one of their jobs was guarding George Washington's life. And they swam very well. They were, that's where Baywatch actually also comes from is this <laughs> moment in, 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 legend, in history of 1776. Um, but they were, they were the lifeguards, which again, seems almost a silly name now, but back then they guarded George Washington's life. These were the guys who turned on him. And I don't care if you're and the it's kind of president. amazing. You, 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 
I, I don't know how much. Uh, I don't want to give away spoilers, but quite a few of them turn. Yeah, turned on him. no, and uh, yeah, you don't want to. I don't want to say who, because you'll see the twists and turns in the first conspiracy. But it, you know, I don't care if you're the best president. I don't care if you're the leader of you know the the army in, in the Revolutionary War. I don't care how strong you are. That moment where you're nearest and dearest, you're best of the best, your inner circle turn on you is devastating for George Washington. Well, and you mentioned um, uh, other things too, like earlier in the book, and maybe this is kind of foreshadowing um, the future betrayals, but his his physician friend, Benjamin Church, turned out to be yeah, a loyalist his, yeah. and was a traitor. Well, and that's where it starts, right? Because once he did, sees- did, Is there those... any reaction to, to, I mean, I know he was, you mentioned he was surprised and he wouldn't believe it, but was is there any more reaction? You, you know, know it's of? funny. We all know George Washington better than probably any president, right? We, he's on the money. He's right there. We see him nearly every day, but we, we also oddly know the least about him as a person. He's not like Jefferson or Adams who write these flowery letters of all their emotions and feelings to their wives or to, you know, to their friends. Washington- keeps everything close to the vest. On the day that he hangs a man in front of 20,000 people, he barely enters in his diary. I mean, there's just no, and the guys, you know, plotting to, whether it's kidnap and kill him, blow up the army, you know, blow up the bridges, nothing. You think this is an inside guy, gathers 20,000 people together and nothing. And, but what he does in the background, is what you were alluding to before, is he develops his entire own secret group to ferret out and figure out the information. Because George Washington realizes you don't just need a good offense in war, you need a good defense. That there's gonna be people trying to infiltrate. So he creates the Committee on Conspiracies. He always had good names for stuff beyond the lifeguards. But the Committee on Conspiracies was led by John Jay, becomes the first Supreme Court Justice in the United States. And John Jay and Livingston and Governor Morris are the three people who are running. It's just three guys because they're so worried about Benjamin Church and other people turning on them that they're like, we need just three people we can trust. We don't want to tell anybody else. And this Committee on Conspiracies starts kicking down doors, starts interrogating people, using all the techniques. They, they are the true first counterintelligence operation of the United States. And so much so that to this day, in Langley headquarters, in CIA headquarters right now in Langley, Virginia, there is a room that is dedicated to John Jay, who they call the father of counterintelligence. It all traces back to this moment in the plot to kill George Washington. Well, how would they do counterintelligence back then? And and by the way, actually, before I, before I say that, yeah. this is, I just want to mention to the listeners, there's a couple of topics I want to talk about with you today. Of course, the first conspiracy. Uh, I definitely want to talk all about that. But I also want to talk about, you've built this fascinating career, you know, all across every media you're interested in, comic books, TV, fiction, now nonfiction. Uh, uh, you know, it's a real... You, you didn't let anyone ever slow you down, and I and I want to I want to talk about how you broke into all these different areas, like particularly like writing for comic books, uh, then going into TV, and then I also uh, I'm fascinated by your TED talk, how to write your own obituary. So I'd like to talk a little about that. Uh, but we'll get to that in a little bit. Let's get back to the first cons conspiracy. Yeah. So your question was um, kind of what did counterintelligence look like back then? Yeah. And um, what does it look like now? Uh. You know, the truth is counterintelligence now is, it used to be, you know, you had dead drops and you had these things. And like now it's just a lot of technology, right? Because that's how we communicate. And you're just trying to kind of crack the new thing that was, I remember I, I always talk to the top CIA guys when I'm, whenever I'm writing a new thriller. And I always want to know the newest tricks to use in the books. And and, and, and I, 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 sorry if I interrupt, yeah, yeah, but go, every go. now and then I don't understand. Yeah, yeah. So when you say, when I'm writing a new book, I talk to the top CIA guys. Not everyone can say that. So do you just say, oh, I'm going to write a book and I need to know something. And you call like the director of the CIA or well, what happens? At this point, you know, I'm doing this 20 years. So at this point I have context that I've, wor I've worked with the Secret Service for I think something like six or seven or eight books now. I know the people that I've worked with. They've worked with me for 15 years. They know they can trust me. They'll tell me things and say, you can't print this, but I need to explain it to you so you understand this. And in all these years, I've never betrayed that confidence. I mean, one, because it's not right. And two, if I did, they'd never talk to me again. And it's the same thing with the, you know, anyone in the CIA. Like I've met people over the years who are like, they, we've established that trust. So you don't just call up and say, hello, CIA headquarters, please send me the director, please. It's Brad. You know, I, there's people who I know who are just very good at things. Um, and thankfully, listen, having the TV show didn't hurt um, because then they could see, oh, you're not some lunatic out there. I know what you look like. And it's so silly, but just knowing what someone looks like and knowing their name from something they've read uh, matters. And I remember my first Secret Service guy I ever approached, I thought, he's never going to help me. 
the word secrets in the title. He's not going to tell me anything. And I sat down in his office. I can still remember it like yesterday. And I sat down and I figured he's going to just blow me off. And he said, Brad, I just want you to know, I read your first book, The 10th Justice. I liked it a lot. And I want to help you with this one. And that was it. He just liked the book. I well, what did him. you ask him? What did you want to know? Um, I wanted to, well, at that point, it was the first one. I wanted to know everything. I was like, is there a secret tunnel below the White House? Is there, you know, how do you get the president out? Where do you go? Where are the safe rooms? What are the things like what? And I remember when I finished the book, I did the secret tunnels below the White House in that book. And, and, and this was pre 9 11. And you could back then buy through the Parks Department, who's actually in charge of the White House grounds, they would sell for $5 the blueprints of the White House, which I bought and, and still own. I have the blueprints of the White House. And were the tunnels in there? And you can figure out very quickly and clear, like I, I, I'm not supposed to say, they used to in fact put, they used to put the tunnels below the Capitol used to be in, they used to put it in the congressional record. It was in the back as an addendum free. And then they started pulling them out the, after 9-11. Yeah, of course. So I remember being with him, we did the secret tunnels below the White House and I handed him the book because at that point I was like, you should look at this and make sure you're okay with everything I'm printing. And you know, it had the secret tunnels below the White House. It had all this good stuff in it. And he reads the book and I said, anything you want me to change? He's like, no. And I'm like, why? And he basically was like, listen, Brad, if you can figure this all out from your home office, do you really think that a terrorist organization with millions of dollars at their beck and call couldn't do the same? And what he was really saying was, Brad, you're not that good. You know, <laughs> I don't know if like, he was saying that. I don't know if he was saying it. Or, but, he, but, but, you know, but they've, they've been, you know, when we, we revealed a couple of years ago that Ronald Reagan carried a gun and the Secret Service gave me that detail. I was in Secret Service headquarters. The guy's like, you want to hear a cool story? And the Secret Service says, you want to hear a cool story? The answer is, what do you say? Of course. Yes, I want to hear your cool story. And they were the ones who let us, you know, reveal that, which, you know, very few people knew. Um, and I love that there are people who trust us to put these stories out there. Is it true, um, this is a side tangent, but um, supposedly the president only stays in the Waldorf Astoria when he's in New York City because there's tunnels underneath the Waldorf Astoria. Yeah, there are, there are, Waldorf is one place, but I don't think it's the only place. I mean, and the sad part is, is so many of the places that we know um, have been revealed. I mean, we used to use this place in West Virginia to evacuate all the congressmen and everyone. And the Washington Post called up one day and was like, hey, you guys really like, is that the secret place? And they were like, oh crap. And we stopped using it. So there's always got to be a new mousetrap. Like we had, one of the CIA guys told me this was uh, maybe five years ago. I, I was like, how do I communicate secretly in the book with a character? And he said, well, here's what you do. Because everyone, if they're tapping your phone, and they're watching everything, I'm like, well, how do you get around it? And he said, here's the trick. He said, you have a Hotmail account. You go onto your Hotmail account, you write the email. You don't hit send. Because once you hit send, it could be traced. He's like, all you do is hit save draft. And then all you do is give me the password to the Hotmail account too. So I go on, I open the same Hotmail account, I open up the draft. I read what you just wrote, and then I write you back and hit save draft. We've never sent a thing. Mm, no smart. one can trace it. Very smart. Until, I remember the general who slept with, uh, with his, with his uh, I'm blanking on his name right Petraeus. now. Petraeus, thank you. Petraeus, of course, you, Steve Cohen knows. Um, yeah, it was Petraeus. Basically sleeps with uh, you know, this woman who's following him around for a book. Guess how they were communicating? Exactly that way. Huh. So it was in our book first, and then I was like, Son of a bitch, like, now I can't do that trick again. So I always, you know, I called him up actually recently. was like, okay, I need a new one. He's like, you saw that? What happened with the general, right? I'm like, I saw, I saw. He's like, that was a good one. So you got to find people who will trust you. So so um, you also bring up the stuff with George Washington in some of your novels. I mean, there's kind of a, you, you sort of mix history and fiction with, with George Washington and his counterintelligence stuff uh, in several of your novels. Yep. Um, yeah, I, Did I'm, that trigger I'm the interest obsessed. in doing the history Yeah, book? and that's where this came from. I mean, I I had found out, uh, I had gotten a call from the Department of Homeland Security a number of years ago asking me to come in so that I could brainstorm different ways a terrorist could attack the United States. And my first thought when they called me was, if they're calling me, we have bigger problems than anybody thinks, right? If you think the country's you know messed up now, like, I mean, they need my help. But I was, sh I, I love the idea. Of course, I went to do it. I would sit in a room with a Secret Service agent. They'd pair me with a chemist. And they would give us a target like New York City and we, they would say, destroy it. And I would come up with my crazy way to get in. Secret Service would have a better way through security. The chemist would say, let's use this chemical. It'll dissipate less quickly in the air. And well, we would, what, what were some of your ideas? We could never, that was the one thing. The one rule is we could never talk about it. We couldn't talk about what they were. I still have, you know, I know what all my ideas are. Okay, what was an idea you didn't talk about because it wasn't good enough? Oh, no, that's a plot. Well, I can't, you can't do that. Was all, well, the funny thing was, is no one knew about the secret program. And... 
if you if you look if you put my name in, it was called the Red Cell Program. You'll actually see there's a Washington Post article eventually that reveals the existence of this secret program. And they said to me, the only reason why they let me talk about it is because I was the only one who kept their mouth shut. Okay. It's like everyone else was like talking about, you know, bragging that they were doing this, and I was the only one who just kept the secret. And they kept coming back to me, and they would email me and give me scenarios. But what I was struck by is why they call me. Of all the people they can call, they got everybody's number. Why are they calling me? You know, a guy who just writes books for a living. And yeah, I, traced it, I traced it back through history, and it traced to a man named George Washington, who had his own secret spy ring during the Revolutionary War, made up of regular ordinary people. And why? Because Washington knew that no one looks twice at an ordinary person, that that's the most powerful thing of all is an ordinary person. And I love that. And I said to my friend in Homeland Security, wouldn't it be cool if you found out George Washington's spy ring exists to this very day? And he said to me, what makes you think it doesn't? And I was like, that's a good idea. Um, and so I became obsessed with George Washington, the culprit ring. That's where I found the story about the assassination attempt to kill him. And I was going to use that in a, in a thriller, but it was too good a story. I was like, why am I going to cannibalize this and use this as fake when it really happened? Um, and I, and that's when I called Josh Mensch and I was like, listen, I'm going to jump down this rabbit hole. I think I want to research this. If we can't find anything, I'll turn it into a thriller book. But if we can find some, we can tell the full story and do a nonfiction book, show people a secret part of history that no one knows. And that's where the whole book, that's where the first conspiracy kind of birthed out of. And by the way, I, it's fascinating because there were a lot of things about, I mean, we sort of grow up thinking we know everything about George Washington because we hear about him from kindergarten sure. on. Uh, and every year we're taught more and more stuff about him. But there's a lot of things I learned about that time period, particularly 1775, 1776, and George Washington, like his attitudes on slavery you discuss and how they changed as a result of some of these events and all the Listen, the first thing stuff. George Washington does when he gets elected as the general and the commander of the army is he orders a set of books on how to be a good general. Like, it's like the dummy's guide, right? It's like, but that's what he does. He orders his British but books he, and things like that. He never really won a battle before he was general and, of the Continental And got his army. butt kicked when we won. You know, we, the problem that we have with history today is we take our heroes, we dip them in granite, we make statues, and they're dead. That's it. There's something to look at. But any person you look up to, whether it's Dr. King or Rosa Parks or George Washington or anyone else, at some point in time was scared and terrified and thought they couldn't do it and felt like, you know what, I need to keep going forward. Well, and the same with George Washington. And if we just if we just put him on that pedestal and dip him in the granite, we've done a disservice. I love the fact that the first thing he does is order books. The first thing he says to John Adams is like, I don't know if I'm up for this thing that you've trusted me with. I love, that makes him more interesting to me, not less. Seeing him as this thing of perfection is not only wrong, but it's it, it doesn't do the story justice. Uh, well, and, and I think it's, it's vital. Kind of, it's kind of funny because, and this is, outside the context of your book. But we sort of think of, when you look at like uh, the beginning of US history, we sort of think of July 4th, 1776, and then we immediately skip forward to 1789 <laughs> right, right. and George Washington becomes president. Sure. It sort of leaves out the fact, like you mentioned, the British don't, you know, the British invade and take over New York City in the, in the events in your book in 1776. They don't leave until 1783. No, you'd say there's an eight year long war. I mean, the thing that's amazing is we tell the story to our kids now. We love, you know, and even to ourselves, we were taught it that the British were over there and we were over here. They came over here, we beat them, and then they went back over there. And it's a great story. And then the U.S. started. And then the U.S. was born and we held hands and we beat the greatest fighting force ever known to mankind. It's a great story, but it's not a true story. And the story, to me, is far more interesting. You know, at the time in New York, um, as the first conspiracy shows, the number of loyalists on the British side was almost equal to the number of Americans here. We were just divided as, as you know, that, that city was divided as can be. And even in our own army, there were the people who were in the Massachusetts regiment. There's a scene at Harvard Yard where the Massachusetts regiment is meeting the Virginia regiment for the first time. And they start making fun of the Virginia regiments has this kind of frilly thing on their collar that they wear. And a fight breaks out. And George Washington comes racing in and he grabs the two guys by the throat and he's shaking them. And he's basically saying, stop fighting with each other. You know, we're on the same team. If ever there were a metaphor for where we are right now as a culture, right? We were just as divided then as we are now. Or, Even for the revolution itself, it was the you know, same thing. It's 30% conservative, 30% liberal, and 30% apathetic. And there were people who were like, we don't need to like secede from British rule. Just make a better deal with the with the king. We just got to just make a better financial deal. We'll be just fine. Well, well, let me ask you, 
Uh, and again, this is kind of outside of the context of the book, but not really because this 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 led this sort of thinking led to the assassination plot. But do you think we should have had a revolutionary war? I mean, what why why do you think we America seceded from? Uh, I think you know I I think because a, there's nothing more powerful in the whole universe than an idea. And what that war started as was about money, and we didn't like being taxed, and we didn't like you know the government kind of treating us crappy, and that's always the cause of like being upset with your rulers. But then what happened is but the in tax there, wasn't even bad for us. Right, I'm like saying, the tea well, tax, well, depends, the tea tax wasn't bad. I'm saying, but it depends. You know, it was a financial thing in the beginning. They were just pissed off that you know they were being they weren't there. It was their rights to blah blah blah. But eventually, in there, an idea is unleashed, an idea of freedom and democracy, and these things that like. Things like that catch fire. I mean, I don't want to call it like the original viral video, but it's kind of the original viral video for America. Like it's that idea. And slowly that idea spreads. We're getting our butts kicked, right? We think of ourselves again as we all banded together, we held hands and we beat the British. But the first battle in Brooklyn that we had here, one of the first battles in, in uh, when the British invaded is a total disaster. George Washington gets out generaled. He doesn't have the experience of the British generals. We get out fought. Our men barely have gunpowder and shoes, much less being able to fight these British trained soldiers. Also, New York City in general, being like a port town, yeah, it's a the mess. British had 150 ships. Right. We have, we, no, have we have no Navy, right? So we're pinned down in the Battle of Brooklyn. We're pinned down. George Washington's pinned down on the East River. He should be dead. He should die there. And that's what's supposed to happen. Uh, another general might have said, you know what? We're going to rage forward, beat, him, beat his chest and say, we're going to take out as many as we can with us. We're going to go out in a blaze of glory. But instead, George Washington does the best thing he always does is he says, you know what? He's going to he's going to adapt. He's going to come up with a new idea. And that's what he does. He adapts. He basically says, instead, let's have a daring escape. In the middle of the night, they, they commandeer every uh, boat that's nearby, and small boats, little ones that they can find, and they start putting, you know, small ones, big ones, all his men on, on board. But here's the key moment. George Washington won't get on board any of the boats until all of his men are on there first. And they see this group that was fighting like crazy and hated each other. That's one of those moments where they see him willing to risk his life. It seems like it's all of these moments that really defined his career as opposed to any one action. So for instance, you know, he 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 didn't become a permanent president when he could have you know, he well, only, listen, he, he only I mean, left right. after two terms. He insisted on being called Mr. President instead of your excellency or whatever, or your highness. So it's all these small moments that kind of- The small saw. moments are always the big moments. You know that, yeah. right? And, and, and what are they moments of? They're moments not of power. They're moments of character. They're moments of decency. That's why we love George Washington. The greatest thing George Washington achieves, it, it's not winning the war. It's not being the first president. It's not any of that. The greatest thing he does is when the war is over, he can be the king of New York. He can easily be the first king here, King George the one here, because that's what we're used to. They would have easily made him king. He was so popular. And in fact, King George in, in Britain says to the painter Benjamin West, what's he doing now that the war is over? And, and Benjamin West says to him, he's going home. He's going back to Mount Vernon. And, and King George says, if he does that, he's the greatest man. He'll be the greatest man who ever lived. And that's exactly what George Washington does. Mm -hmm. And he does it again after his second term. He could have had a third and a fourth or whatever he wanted, but he instead says no, he wants to have faith in us as a country, faith in us as a people, and walks away from the power. That's his greatest legacy. So why do you think, why do you think he did that? Like given that so many people would probably choose the opposite. I, you know, I think at the end of the day, you know, George Washington, when he was a little kid, used to copy, I think it was 110 rules of civility. And there were silly rules. They were like, you know, when you're talking to someone, don't spit in their face accidentally when you're talking and don't pick your teeth in public. But there were good rules about being a moral person and, and, and having humility and modesty. And he used to hand copy all the rules, these 100 plus rules, and he just copy them. And maybe it was this assignment that he just had to. Um, but I feel like he was forever raised as a proper Virginian gentleman. He didn't, have, he didn't come from money. He didn't have an education. He was a terrible speller. He was good at math because he was a surveyor. But he was a, you know, I, I think at the end of the day, he had nothing. His family was dead. His brother dies. His, his dad is dead. And, and we all think that we need George Washington. He needed us too. He needed this army. He needed this group. He was abandoned everywhere else. And I think at the end of the day, um, I think he did have that moral center. 
I think he had, and, and that's why we revere him. It's not because he won. There are lots of people who won wars. You can look at whether it's Grant or anyone else who you know, made president because they were, they were military men. But the reason he lasts is because he can walk away from it. And, and I, I wish we can get that, you know, the one thing is I'll never know, you'll never know, no one will ever know what's really in George Washington's head because he's very quiet about these things. We can only judge him by his actions and by what he says to others when he's talking to them. Um, and mm-hmm. when you see those moments over and over, what you see are those small moments of humility and generosity of spirit. And, and listen, it's not that he was a great general. We lose in Brooklyn, he retreats. He loses in the next spot, he retreats. He loses in the next spot, he retreats. He goes to Jersey, retreats. Hey. The only thing that George Washington does over and over and over is he won't give up. That's it. He just is like outlasts. It's not about win. These days, we're all investors, trying to be smart with our money despite our worst impulses. But at iShares, we believe that deep down inside of every investor is a better investor. One that's just waiting to be let out. Explore iShares ETFs and insights and let your best investor out. Visit iShares.com for more information. You know what I love about fantasy sports is that even though I'm not going to be a great basketball player or a baseball player or a football player or whatever, I feel like I get to participate and make decisions and use my knowledge of these different leagues to, or these different sports to, to compete. So it's like I can pick my team or I can pick my favorite players and I could use my knowledge to make predictions and maybe even make money. So with the basketball season here, you can now pick combo projections across football and basketball from the specials league on prize picks. This is a league created specifically for combo projections that include two or more players from different sports or leagues. Want to play alongside some of prize picks, favorite players like rapper Meek Mill and comedian Andrew Schultz, who's also been a guest on this podcast and I've been a guest on his. You can now find community plays under the promos tab of the app to view entries for some of the biggest names in the prize picks community each week. Look, prize picks even offers a reboot policy so that your entries stay in play. Even if one of your players gets injured for football and basketball games, if you have a player who exits the game in the first half and does not return in the second, that player is rebooted. Prize picks is the only daily fantasy sports platform with an injury insurance policy. What? So, I love playing it. I love anywhere where I can use analytical ability with my interests to demonstrate some skill and maybe make some money. And I like the game like aspect. I do wish they had chess as a category on prizepicks.com, but I'll set up for what they've got. Maybe I should make my own fantasy chess league. But in any case, I love prize picks. Go to prizepicks.com slash James. Use code James for a first deposit match. Up to $100. That's the easiest $100 you're ever going to make. So that's prizepicks.com slash James and use code James. Daily fantasy sports made easy. The future of learning is definitely online. Like it's such BS that you have to spend $200,000 or take $200,000 in loans and go to some fancy school when it's useless. It doesn't guarantee you a job. Most employers, including me, do not care about degrees or grades or anything like that. We want to care that you love what you're doing, that you know what you're doing, in some cases that you have experience or that you're willing to learn. But people in general love learning and are curious. Like The key to success is curiosity. And I think masterclass.com is the perfect model for online learning. I'm really happy they're they're sponsoring uh, this episode. If you're going to give a gift, give the gift of learning. Masterclass makes a meaningful gift this season for you and anyone on your list because both of you can learn from the best to become your best from leadership to effective communication to cooking. Let me tell you some of the classes I've taken. I've taken comedy from Steve Martin. I mean, can you believe I can take a class from Steve Martin on comedy or Judd Apatow, my favorite comedy director. I could take an actual class from him on writing. Wolfgang Puck on cooking. 
Dan Brown on writing or Judy Bloom, who's been on this podcast on writing. By the way, Wolfgang Puck also has been on this podcast. It's such a pleasure. I, I try to take classes all the time from masterclass.com. And whether you're watching Masterclass on TV or listening in audio mode in the app or on their site, the quality speaks for itself. It's like these Masterclass instructors are your own personal mentors that are going to help you reach the next level. How much would it cost to take one-on-one -on -one classes on comedy from Steve Martin or on chess from Gary Kasparov? You just wouldn't be able to do it. But it would, I mean, it would cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. With a Masterclass annual membership, it's $10 a month. Membership started at $120 a year for unlimited access to one-on-one -on -one classes with all 180 plus masterclass instructors. So it's not just $120 for one instructor. You get all 180 plus masterclass instructors. Boost your confidence and find practical takeaways you can apply to your life and at work. And if you own a business or are a team leader, use Masterclass to empower and create future-ready employees and leaders. That's the real education in today's world. So this holiday season, you can give one annual membership and get one free at masterclass.com slash JAS. JAS, of course, stands for the James Altucher Show. So right now you can get two memberships for the price of one at masterclass.com slash JAS. Masterclass.com slash JAS. Offer terms apply. You know, and, and I think most people don't even realize in, in 1780, he was losing. So like he lost Philadelphia, the, the center of the, right. I mean, he's of the get colonial our United States. Over and over. They were begging him to quit being general. Yeah. Like, and yet, and, and, and I think this is kind of left out of the history books. And yet, you know, he kept going. Well, that's the thing is we we, we love to think that history, and we teach our history, sadly, as, as if it's a bunch of dates and facts you have to memorize. That's not what history is at all. History is a selection process. And it chooses every single one of us every single day. And the only question is, do you hear the call? The call is there. What, what do you do with it? What do you mean? I feel, I feel like you're communicating a deep thought here. No, it's a, <laughs> like, it is a deep thought. I mean, right? Every day you can go out and be a better person. And you can make history. What do you have to do to make history? Help one person. Be kind to one person. That's all history is. History is not something that just goes backwards. And that we look back, everything that hasn't happened is is history that's waiting to be written. Well, this and this segues a little bit into your your TED talk, how to write your own obituary. And I want to get back to the first conspiracy, but maybe how did that TED talk come yeah, about? Yeah, um, this was early on in the TED days, um, and it was one they were doing in Miami, and um, the it came about because I had worked to save the house where Superman was created. I went to, I was researching a book and I went to see where Superman was created in Cleveland, Ohio. I wanted to see the place. I was like, show me the place. I want to see his bedroom, like where it was dreamed up. Jerry Siegel's hometown and Joe Schuster, the artist lived around the corner. I'm like, these 17 year old boys gave us Superman. I want to see the house. And when I got there, the house was devastated. It was totally wrecked. And I said, I want to help save it. And we got together with a bunch of people, um, everyone from David Letterman and Stephen Colbert and Jim Lee and Joe Casada, like Marvel and DC, they all, we, everyone pitched in stuff. And we raised the money, saved the house. A reporter for the Wall Street Journal was interviewing me about it. He said, you know, Brad, this thing you did with the Superman house, it's going to be in your obituary. And my first thought was, thanks for so clearly contemplating my death, right? But I was struck by that question. What are they going to say about me? What am I going to be? And a year went by and I couldn't shake it. And same thing with, with First Conspiracy. Like when years go by and I'm still thinking of an idea, I know write the book. I know do the story if I can't shake it for long. Mm. And I went back a year later to the Wall Street Journal reporter and I said to him, I need to ask you a favor. Um, can, I want you to, I want to hire you to write my obituary. And he wrote it. And he, you know, and I was reading through it. It said, you know, Brad Meltzer, a versatile Brooklyn-born novelist, spun a childhood passion for comic books and a prosecutor's zeal for research into a string of best-selling thrillers, died yesterday at his home. He was 40-something years old, whatever it said. I was such a narcissist. I think I'm going to try this. This is a, good, I, I, this is a fun I, idea. So you better credit me. So <laughs> the- uh, <laughs> I will. And so- You've heard it here. The, so what happens is, and the thing is, don't oh, you'll see why you can't write it yourself. You have to let someone else write it. You don't get to write your own obituary. You can try, but they will not publish it. You have no guarantees. Um, and that is, I said, I was such a narcissist wanting to read my accolades and what I accomplished that I didn't read the body of his email. I just read the attachment. And in the body of the email, what it said was, hey, Brad, I got called on to another story, so I never got to finish your obituary. And as I'm reading through my own obituary, 
My obituary ends mid-sentence with these three words. He was a, and it just ends. That's it. And I'm like, wait, he was a what? What was I? Was I good? Was I bad? Did I matter? Did I achieve greatness? What was I? And I know there are so many people, and I know, James, I can see it on your face. You're doing, asking yourself right now, what are you, right? And that is what my talk is about, is what are you? And together, when you watch the talk, put in the word Brad Meltzer obituary, you'll find it immediately, um, is to answer the question, like, what is our, and it really becomes not just what your, what your obituary says, but it's what your legacy is. Because I realized, you know, there's the things you do for yourself and those things you do for other people, right? And and you got to separate those two things. You got what you do for yourself is it will be in your obituary where you went to school, what your job was. It'll be there. But those things you do, but but when you die, it's one of the last times those things will ever be mentioned. Your job title fades with you. Your your resume is gone. That's it. It fades over time. But those things for other you do for other people, that's your legacy. Because that's what legacy is, right? It's what endures. It's what lasts. It's your impact on other people. So you got to separate, you know, if you figure out who's going to remember you, you'll figure out how you'll be remembered. And those things you do for other people, that's going to be what your legacy really is. So do you find after that TED Talk, which was obviously very impactful on a lot of people, it was downloaded, I don't know, 100,000 yeah, times. times. Yeah. yeah. Uh, did that change your life doing that TED talk? It did. It totally changed my life because I started giving the talk and I started doing it. I do, you know, I still do it for corporate events and things like that. It's become like a whole new thing with more research and more stuff in it. But you can't give that talk. And I would say probably a year went by and I saw the impact it was having where I stopped and having, there's a real big, I don't want to ruin it, but you'll see there's a call to action at the end for it. And I had to stop and say, wait, what am I, instead of just giving advice and saying, here's a better way to live, and then you should see it in the talk, but I had to ask myself the question, what am I gonna do? What change am I gonna make? And um, one of the things it says uh, for myself is I took this hard look at myself and I was writing thrillers at that point and I thought I was gonna just write these thrillers forever. But what I realized is, is I realized what I wanted my legacy to be and it was about being a dad. And, I, and that's where I said, you know what, I need to do something that's just for my kids. And that's where I started writing the I Am Kids Book Series. Mm. We did the Ordinary People Change the World Series. We started with I Am Amelia Earhart and I Am Abraham Lincoln. We did I Am Rosa Parks and Albert Einstein. I Am Jackie Robinson. Um, we've done Dr. King and George Washington and Gandhi. And we just came out with Neil Armstrong. And next month we come out with I Am Billie Jean King. It's I think our 17th book. And all of that came out of this talk of me taking a hard look at myself and saying, you know, there's all these things I want to do, but where, what do I really want to leave behind? How do I put good into the world? When I was five years old, Jim Henson taught me and, and Mr. Rogers taught me on Sesame Street and on Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood that I could, you could use your creativity to put good into the world. And to this day, that's all I'm trying to do is use my own creativity to put good into the world. Well, and, and so when you were first, you were, you were in law school, you were first writing, trying to write thriller novels, you were rejected 24 times for uh, your very first one, I guess, The Tenth Justice. Mm -hmm. uh, and what made you, th like, what makes someone think they should keep going after they're rejected so much? Because, you know, I think in every profession, everybody who rises up starts off sucking, just by definition almost. Well, listen, I mean, right, it's George Washington, right? You, we all see the, the guy in granite and we don't see the guy's ass kicked on all these battles. We right. just love seeing the finish line. Right, and like for you, People see, oh, he's written 11 thriller bestsellers. Right, they're like, oh, he did that. Like, I he got my ass great. kicked over and over. No, I got, you know, there's this one, and I did this book about heroes for my kids, and there's this woman named Wilma Rudolph in there, and she's this Olympic runner, and when she's a young kid, I'm going to make the story really quick, but um, they tell her, she's, they put her legs in cast, they say, you're never going to walk. You're never going to be able to walk. And her mom rides her on the bus however many hours, every day, back and forth to the doctor's doctor. She's like, you're never going to walk. And she says, instead of listening to the doctors, I listened to my mother who said, you're going to walk. And they take her cast off and they take her legs out of the braces that she's wearing. And she starts running and she becomes one of the fastest women alive. She wins multiple gold medals. I think the most in that point in like in all of history in America, I don't know, an incredible story. Like one of the great long you know, runners in, in, in Olympic history. But the key moment for that to me is it's not how you start, it's how you finish. And at her start, it was a disaster. We all look at the finish, but it's the finish. And and for me, I got my rear end kicked. And what what made me keep going is just a desire to get and, and to do it. 
I, I don't know, you can call it stubbornness, you can call it motivation, you can call it, put it whatever adjective you want on it to make it sound grand and wonderful. But the truth was, I just was determined that if they didn't like that book, I'm going to write another. And if they don't like that, I'm going to write another because that's what I felt like my mission was. And the one thing I know in life is the moment you tell me I can't do something, that is all I want to do. That is well, my one thing I know. My, my friend Simon Sinek ta taught me that about myself. Full credit to him. He said to me, Brad, with you, the struggle matters. The moment you've done something, you don't really care about doing it. But the moment anyone, in fact, I forgot about this. This is perfect. The first conspiracy was a book. I was a thriller writer. I wasn't supposed to do anything else. And I went to the publisher and I said, I want to do a nonfiction book. And I had this idea about George Washington. This was years ago. And my own publisher, and now I've sold millions of books. I've sold for 20 years, I'm selling books. And my own publisher said, we're not interested. Rejected me. I still got my, I got, there's my 25th, you know, I've got even more than that, but that was another rejection. They said, and I said, okay, let's go to another publisher. And the publisher that did this, you'll see, look at the spines of my book is a different publisher than my thriller writers. I was like, I want to do this now more than ever. You say, I can't do it. And the book just, I still have that in me of just that need to do what someone says but, you can't do. But, and, I, and I love that because, you know, many people would think, oh, don't you need a PhD in history to write a history book? And you essentially gave yourself permission to be a historian. Listen, I have a which, degree in history. I mean, I went to Michigan, my degree well, is in history, but at the end of the day, what I am is a storyteller, right? You've been listening for the last 40 something minutes because you and I are telling stories. Again, we talked about the most powerful thing in the world is an idea, but what are stories? They're just a collection of ideas. The Bible is not a bunch of, you know, rules to live by. It's a bunch of stories. We right. just take power from them. And and I feel like in this book, uh, you know, it's different from the average history book in that you can feel there's kind of a a, th a thriller writer or a mystery writer writing this book. Like hundred percent. You, you leave each chapter with a cliffhanger. There's very there's kind of elements that I would expect to see in every thriller book, not in every history book, but I see them in this book, and that kind of makes this riveting and a, and a page turner. What do you say? What would you say is kind of the skeleton? of a thriller that you you could apply to other topics like this, for instance. Just in yeah, general, I for, mean, for the funny thing this? is, is I, I, you know, I, I feel like you can take anything and make it a thriller. I can take, you go into the bathroom, you walk into the bathroom. That, that's definitely Okay, here a it is, ready? I'm gonna do it for you right now. Uh, you see the shower curtain on your left, and there's a noise on the opposite side of the closed shower curtain. The end, right? Like, right there, you know there's a problem. And I guarantee you, now that I've said that, the next time you walk in, there's a closed shower curtain in the bathroom, <laughs> you're going to be thinking of me in the toilet, right? Like you're going to be, because that's it. I mean, but that's like, you can that's take like anything. To me, me it's not the, bang, you know, Hitchcock, to paraphrase him, has the greatest quote on all of it, is it's not the bang that's scary. It's the anticipation of it. So if I tell you, you know, uh, that, so, so when you're outlining a story, let's, yeah. so let's take any any of your thrillers, yeah. What what are what are the beats that you feel you need to to hit? Yeah, and then, and then there's kind of the more granular stuff. With okay, I'm gonna have to leave each chapter with a cliffhanger. I'm gonna have short chapters to keep people going. So there's kind of the more granular, uh, more elemental stuff. But what are the what are the beats you feel you need to hit in a thriller? Yeah, it's funny, you know. I and I love this about you. You you have like this. Um, your brain works so differently than mine. You want to have it all explained, and you want a list of it and how to do it. And in my head, it, it's like saying, "How do you breathe, James?" Like, you know, and, and you're like, well, you, you take a breath in, you know, or ride a bicycle. I always say is if you want to learn how to write a book, you just got to write the book. I can tell you when you ride a bicycle, well, pedal three miles an hour, find your center of balance, hold the handlebars, make sure you're going fast enough. And now you're riding a bike. But to me, the only way you ever, I can give you, I can write that down a million times for you. The only way you will ever learn how to ride a bike is you got to get on the bike and pedal. That's it. The way that I learned to swim, I'll tell you, I'll reveal my, my life here is Joey Tusa um, at camp had a brother who was, we were probably eight years old and his younger brother was three years or so younger and he was looked about five years old. And all the kids who were eight and 10 could swim in the deep end. I couldn't swim in the deep end. And Joey Tusa's friggin' little brother came and was swimming in the deep end. And I was so like, what? that kid can swim in the deep end? He's three years younger than me? So I walked over to the diving board and I got on the diving board in the deep end of the pool and I jumped. It was a terrible plan. I should have asked a parent. I should have asked someone. I didn't even know if the lifeguard was looking, but like I jumped. I learned to swim right there. Like I doggy paddled. I jumped to the side to make sure I hit the wall sooner, but I figured it out. Like, and I learned how to ride a bicycle because Ellen Nagel, my next door neighbor, I saw her father taking off her training wheels. 
And I remember going, and I don't know where my parents are in any of these stories. I had these loving parents, but I don't know where they are. But I saw them taking off her training wheels. And I was like, she's going to ride a bike with no training wheels. And I said to her dad right there, I said, can you take the training wheels off my bike? And I went on the hill, uh, you know, a hill was like a little uh, incline in the back of our, where we lived in Brooklyn. And I just rode down it. I'm sure I crashed a number of times, not that first time, but I figured out how to do it. And to me, that's how I write a book. You got to sit down and write the book. I can tell you all the rules, but I don't have any rules to do any more like than- Like when my, you're outlining, you don't think, okay, right here, our hero needs to meet his friends and he needs to yeah, see well, the villain. I mean, okay, and I, then we need to guess at I do the think, wrong villain. And Yeah, I mean- some of it's gut, like, you know, there's a, and again, going back to my friend Simon Sinek, he talks about, you know, his three things of a bullseye. He has a, the best TED talk, one of the best I've ever seen. And he talks about it. every life is like a bullseye and, and the outside circle of the bullseye is what you do. And we all know what we do. We know what our jobs are, but the second circle is, is how you do what you do. And some people know how you do what you do. Like a plumber knows, put this pipe on this one and then you put them together and the water will flow. But writers or someone who runs a podcast, like, what makes a good podcast? You just, you, your gut tells you some things that are good. You know a good story when you hear it. You can, you just have a gut for it. You can't really say how you do it, but you know you do it. And that's how I feel about writing. Like I do have, you know, I need to show a little bit of their life or I may need a cliffhanger, but I just, I, it's not like I'm like, oh, I'm on page 35. This is where the thing has to go. That's not writing. That's, mm -hmm. that's playing connect the dots. Um, to me, I guarantee if you graft out my books, I'll bet you that the hook happens at a different point. Some on page one, some on page 40. And at 10th Justice, the hook happens on page 40. I know that. The first conspiracy, um, we try and get you on page one. It's a page, like now I'm like, people have no patience page one. So I try and hook you by page one. But the bad guy in the reveal, it's wherever it seems right. It's just my gut. You mentioned you mentioned people have no patience. Do you think that's changed your writing? The fact that uh, attention spans in general have gone gone down. I mean, I noticed in this book is very short chapters. You're very, you're very concerned about sort of making sure people get, go to the next chapter. Like, yeah, so it's funny so. that I've always done that. I mm -hmm. always had, that's just because what I like to read. Mm -hmm. That's not, I wish that was like reverse engineered that like I figured out how to get people. No, it's just that I have no patience. So I do what I like to read. I want it to go quick. I have no patience for it. If not, I'll watch the movie. What I do think has happened though, and this is where I, I failed myself is the first book I ever wrote, The 10th Justice, the hook happened on page 40. And somewhere along the way, whether it's being reviewed or whether it was ever it was, I was worried that I wasn't hooking people fast enough. And mm. so I started making the hook happen quicker. And I think over- What's an example of hook? Uh, you know, the, the 10th Justice opens and it's about a Supreme Court clerk who inadvertently leaks a decision. Uh, he tells his friend, that, that he meets the works at the court. He says, here's how the decision's gonna come out. He, you know, he has a good reason to tell him there, you know, he just had met him and the guy had helped him. And, and then uh, the decision comes out and he goes to find his friend and the phone is dead. And he looks up the guy and he sees this guy never existed. He never worked at the court. He just leaked the decision inadvertently without knowing it. And he just let all the, you know, millions of dollars change hands and it's all his fault. And no one knows it's his fault. And it takes 40 pages before you figure out, you got to lay in the guy and make, show you why he meets him and show who Ben is and show what he has to lose. And then on page 40, you, sh you, know, you punch him in the stomach as hard as you can and you wa let the reader watch it. Um, and I got worried that it wasn't fast enough. So if you were to do it differently now, or if you were to try to make it, it earlier, would you start off with like- but What I did is for a decade, I basically started just moving it faster. I started page one, chapter one, first sentence, you know? Uh, eight, like, minutes like from, an, eight minutes from now, one of us will be dead. No one could see it coming. Huh. That's the book of fate, page one, chapter one, first line. We, someone, one of us will be dead. No one could see it was coming. Eight minutes, tick, tick, right? I got to get you on line one. I have no patience. The failure that I made though, is I started writing more plot than character hmm. and the book suffered for it. And the last book I did that I came on to speak with you, The Escape Artist, uh, I just decided, you know what? You're 20 years in, don't do it the same way just go with your gut, look back on what your favorite books were. And they were the 10th justice. They were the ones that took their time. They built, but for the most part, it's because they love how you reacted and you were just all in and you know which ones are your best ones are the ones where you're all in. And that X factor is why that, you know, you want to write your obituary, find what you love and keep doing it. That's it. It's the best advice. My parents, I was at the, um, I went to see the history department at the University of Michigan where I went to school. And I said, what are your issues now that you're dealing with? And they said, here's our problem. They said, all these kids who love and want to study history, 
their parents tell them they can't make a living doing it. So we are losing all these students. It's happening throughout all the liberal arts. People, parents are just getting in the way and being like, can't make a living doing that. My parents, my, none of my parents went to four-year colleges. I was the first in my family, to, immediate family, to go to a four-year college. They were like, you're studying history, go for it. And that was the one beautiful thing among many that they did for me is they didn't give a crap. They just let me follow whatever that passion was. And I think if you do that, that's, I mean, that's the real secret. And look, 30 years later, you right, write Right, you write a book, you right, because I'm, right, and there I am. I'm literally using my degree, at, which I finally, would, none of it would have. parents are saying, right. finally. Yeah, exactly. I so, finally tried to do something so, good. So, so how did you go from, I'm always interested in people who essentially give themselves permission to do what they're not supposed to do. So like your publisher didn't want you to do history book, you didn't want, and you, but you gave yourself permission to do it. You did it, you wrote this fascinating book. I learned a huge amount from it. How'd you get into comic books? You've written some excellent comic book series. Yeah, uh, no, Justice same League, exact thing. I just love it. It's my, if you said to me, what books did you read growing up? I read Agatha Christie, of course, but I read comics. They were my favorite thing. In fact, my first book, The 10th Justice, um, since that book, I used to hide comic book references. I still do in every one of my books. No one will ever find all of them. I don't care how nerdy you are. You'll never find them all. Um, and one of the heads of DC Comics, uh, they, they were doing Green Arrow at the time with Kevin Smith, the director. And Kevin, it was uh, Green Arrow was their number one superhero book at the time for DC. And they basically, now comics are cool, but a decade ago, no one gave a crap. It wasn't cool. There were no movies like that. It was like, you know, you were slumming if you did comic books. And... They said, if we bring in another comic book writer with our number one book, everyone's going to go, where's the director? But they said to me, you know, you write these thrillers. The guy knew I'd love comics because the references he saw in the book. He's like, if we bring you in, no one knows who you are. They'll be like, why is DC taking their number one book and giving it to some writer who writes thrillers? And they said to me, you'll either fail on a big stage or you'll succeed on a big stage, but it's our number one book, our number one superhero book. So I had it's no all idea yours. Green Arrow was their number one book. Because of Kevin Smith. That's huh. why. Not anymore. You know, now it's back to Batman, but- Kevin Smith came in and took it over. And they said, you will, because of him, this is a giant stage. It's our number one superhero book. You'll either fail on this stage and everyone's going to watch you fail or you're going to succeed on the stage and everyone's going to watch you succeed. And I was like, I'll take those chances any day. Give me the stage. Give me the stage. Give me the mic. And I took the book and God bless Kevin Smith said, stick around. What's coming is good. Um, and I got my start. And I, and I remember I was, at, I was at an event in New York at the Barnes and Noble downtown. And the last person in line was the editor from DC Comics. And he said, hey, Brad, would you like to write Green Arrow? And I looked up and I said, I've been waiting my whole life for someone to ask me that. And and again, when it happened, it was Kevin Smith was first through the door. And then I came and I was like, not because it was cool. not No one liked anything. I just wanted to do it because I love frigging comic books. Because for, at that point, five years of my life, six years, I've been hiding references in there. So why did I do it? Because I love it. And that's, to me, why it worked. And the moment I'm tired of doing it, don't do it anymore because you're not going to love it as much. Do you think? Do you think you're tired now of writing thrillers? You've basically. I think been doing I was for, for a little years. bit. I think I was until, and but that's why I jump away. The, mm -hmm. the first thing I do when I jump away and do the first conspiracy, the guess what? The first thing I want to do is I now want to write a thriller because now I can't write the thriller. I got to work on this book. So it, it re I found I figured out it recharges me. It really does, and I think, and the truth is, I think that that having them not do as well for a couple books. It was one of the kinds of thing is like, oh, oh, you think I can't do it anymore? Watch this. I feel like I feel like you could uh, build on this though. Like you could write a book, the second conspiracy, oh. and the third conspiracy. And we find, are okay. So what's, yeah, yeah. what's what's the second conspiracy? I can't tell you. Yeah, we're gonna we're working on it now. There's so many things you can't tell me. Yeah, you, tell me one plot to destroy New York City. Yeah, no, I know you want to know that one, right? That's the one. <laughs> but you know, the funny thing is, is if you tell all your stuff. Um, then they'll find me and kill me. That's what they do. <laughs> and what did you learn when you were writing uh, The First Conspiracy? You know, I think for me, you know, I, I like to think about it like this. If, if George Washington came back and looked at us right now, what would he say? I think he'd be embarrassed of where we are, right? He spent all this time, like we were saying, there was no f American flag back then. Now we have leaders who drape themselves in the flag and say how much they love the country. Again, whatever your politics are, you've got someone on your side who does that. And, you know, we, we there wasn't a United States back then. As I said, he built it. He put his arms out and said, no, jackasses, don't fight with each other. We're on the same team. And we've lost that sense of the United States. That United is gone. Um, we have half the country watching one version of the news and half the country watching the other set. And whatever set you're watching, you are missing reality. 
because your set, for the most part, is basically giving you the bias that you want. If we don't like what you say anymore, I unfriend you and I unfollow you. And we all sit in our little kind of zones and, you know, with people that tell us what it is. I highly recommend to every person listening, go follow someone who has the exact opposite opinion. They'll infuriate you. You'll be like, that is a moron. But I promise you, you'll start eventually in there, see something that goes like, oh, that's why they think that. Um, and and I feel like for me, what I take from the book is not, uh, it's titillating to say there was a secret plot to kill George Washington. And I know that's why the publisher wants that to be the title and that's the subtitle for the book. But what I hope I learned from it is what it means to be an actual leader. And, and, and I think, you know, one of the things it says, uh, again, my friend Simon Sinek gave me for I Am George Washington, our kids' book. There's a line in the kids' book that says, um, leadership isn't about being in charge. It's about taking care of those in your charge. And I can't say it any better than that. Well, in, I mean, you give many moments of that in the book, but I think it's how you, when you're doing the research for this, obviously you're seeing thousands of events and and figuring out which ones to pull into the book. Like for instance, George Washington, you know, by hand splitting up uh, the fight between the Massachusetts soldiers and the Virginia soldiers. That's an important moment because it's also a metaphor for the times we live in right now. And I feel like you're, the whole book you're thinking of a little bit in relationship to how these events uh, are mirrored in today's news. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I listen, all I'm doing is picking out the best stories. That's just the best part. I don't know why people leave these parts out, right? I'm like, there's a moment where George Washington, right when he gets uh, to be the commander, he doesn't have time to make a new uniform, so he orders a sash. Like, he's like, give me a badass sash, like, just so everyone knows I'm the man in charge. Like, that's the best moment for me. I don't care that he has, you know, this kind of horse or what he ate on this day or how many, you know, this of that or the other thing he had in the stockpile. But, like, the fact that he stopped and was like, you know what? I kind of think I need a badass sash is so humanizing. That's the best part to me. So all we did in the first conspiracy is just bring you the best parts. You well, know? well, I think because, you know, in the first conspiracy, you mentioned a lot about George Washington's character, and this is what ultimately held the nation together in critical points. But there's also he... He did a lot to not manipulate, but to sort of manufacture perception about himself. Like at that, yeah, at that course, continental that quiet, Congress. Of course, his quiet also does that, right? I mean, when you're silent and, like and that. And the way he dressed, the way he, his posture. Yeah, I, I, my thing John is Adams not, commented on his posture. That's why they course, made him general. Right. He's the only guy who shows up in a uniform. He literally comes to the Second Continental Congress. They're looking for the commander of the he, army. He's he had the only guy. 20 years. Right. He's, he's the only guy who shows up in a uniform. And they're like, who should we pick? Oh, I know. How about that dude over there who's wearing the, the big military uniform? Like that is, I don't care what anyone says, that is him angling for a job. Right, so on the one hand, he says, I don't know if I'm ready for this to John Adams. But on the other hand, he was sort of subtly campaigning for the, the of spot. Of course, and listen, you got- you, And by the way, it's a hard there. job. <laughs> right, and, and, and so I don't fault him for, you know, I mean, and again, we don't know what he really is. Like, I, I mean, I take away, um, I think it's easy to kind of like, when you're a young Virginian guy and you want to be in power, like I get why you do your things. I think the measure of who he is is when he has power, what he does with it. I think when you have that ability, as we said, to be king and you don't take that, that I, that tells me far more about your character than like that you wore the uniform. And also, you know, you know, and this is kind of the crux of the book with, there's this plot to kill him, to assassinate him in, in, in New York. And he doesn't seem that horrified or anxious. He's not, he's, he doesn't respond like a dictator, for instance. Yeah, I, the thing is, is I don't, that's where I don't buy. I think there's a lot of bullshit there. Like, I, I just don't believe for one second he's not pissed. You don't pick out personally your 50 best men that you want from the top of the army. Pick them out personally. He doesn't give it to like the aide de camp, doesn't give it to someone else. He's mm -hmm. like, uh, uh I got it. These are the best guys. And, and you got a bunch of them who turn on you you are pissed. I don't care who you are. You're pissed. Well, it also goes to show so many people say, oh, I'm a very ju good judge of character. It's really hard to be a good no, judge of character. especially even. when in wartime, when like, you know, half of the guys are switching for money. The other half are like, I don't want to lose. I don't, you know, these patriots look like they're going to lose. I'm going to go with the British. They look like they're going to win. Like, and, and it's sad, but that's how people are. That's what it is. You know, we love to think of the, the Revolutionary Wars, we, you know, we all came together, we believed in this ideal and this idea, and we did it, and it was great, and we were all on the sides, but like for a lot of guys, they were fighting because they were getting a paycheck. 
A lot of them signed up like, oh, young men signed up and old men signed up. Isn't that amazing? They were all behind the idea. No, because you were paying them. And a lot of them needed jobs. The old guys needed jobs. The young guys needed jobs. So we love to paint this picture of it was all wonderful. You know, we're a country founded on legends and myths, but the legends and myths we love most are our own. So given that you like to do the things people are telling you no or the things that are making you uncomfortable, what's what's the next challenge or uncomfortable thing that that you sort of see in the horizon that you'd like to conquer? Yeah, the one we're working on now is um, they're taking the I Am Kids books that we do, the historical uh, illustrated kids books with Chris Eliopoulos and um, PBS, we're making a cartoon show out of them. And so it's Xavier Riddle and the Secret Museum launches in November. We've been working on it for five years. But Did I you write like, the scripts? Um, so I, I came up with the idea and all the characters and exactly how it works. We obviously worked, uh, we brought in a screenwriter to help us break it down. And um, but I came up with this idea of Xavier and Xavier Yadina and their uh, their best friend Brad, who looks remarkably like me, <laughs> um, go back in time when they have a problem and they meet our heroes from the kids' books, and then they bring that that thing back to the current time period. And that's I'm in a totally new universe. We're doing an animated TV show, and we've done two TV shows before, but to do a cartoon show for PBS, and you know, on the st- old stomping grounds of of Sesame Street and Mr. Rogers. I, like, I, that's it, man. I have a question about that. Like, and I've always just been curious about this. When you're making a animated show and you don't like how something is quote unquote shot, can you just go back and say, do this different? I mean, yeah, you know, the, no, no. the animator is already. Broke. No. So what you do, what you get is you get what's called an animatic. You get a, um, they call it a Leica now, but it's basically like a pencil drawing of it. So it barely moves. It kind of, it's like, so people haven't put in a lot of time. But you can kind of see the guy turns his head this way and then goes, huh? And then you can kind of see, it's not perfect, but you can see the movement and you can go like this, you know, there's some things you just got to see move. And that way when you say, I don't like this part, they can easily cut it because the animator just did it like super scribbly and barely. Mm. And then the next version comes and it's like really deeper and then the next version comes colored. And then you, you like, I in fact just got one that I was looking to approve they sent me and I'm going through it and and I said, can we do add a joke here? I just saw a joke that I hadn't seen before. And I was like, how about adding this joke here? And they just wrote me back. They're like, that would have been better for Leica. It's too late now. Like I could, it was just too so late. When's that coming out? When's the series coming uh, out? November of this year. So so Brad Meltzer, uh, this book, your, your, your first history book, the first com- conspiracy, the secret plot to kill George Washington. This was a, a page, not only a page turning thriller for me, but I learned a lot. I learned a huge amount about George Washington. Isn't that what we all want, though? The, the you can always books learn. are the ones where you like learn some. You take away and you're like, I can apply this to my life and be a better person from it. But also is always fascinating researching you because you've done so many different things and you've 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 given yourself permission to do to do all of these things because you love doing them. You don't you, people could say no to you, you're gonna figure out how to do it. And you did it with this history book. It's a great book. I highly recommend it. I enjoyed it. And I really want to know what the second conspiracy is. Can you just yeah. give us a name? Just tell us something. I, I, it's, it's, it's actually about Steve Cohen. He's uh, the producer. I believe in it. The I believe They're Steve great. Cohen's Historical. the master. He might be... He might be the, the I, secret you, you counterintelligence. Should have, you should have, by ring. the way, when you interviewed Steve, you should have done a reference count on the podcast. So like, you know when they have pop-up videos? So that every time he made a reference, we did it. Like we, did you, I know you counted, but I want us to see it like in real time, like each one, uh, like uh, the reference to it. Like that's from Fat that's Albert. That's from so and so. Like it would be amazing. All right, we're gonna have to redo that one yeah, and uh, make it a pop up video, and just so you can just trace to what he's talking about. It's fantastic. We videotaped so, that one. We could do it. Yeah, it's so. a good one. All right, I, well, I smell an intern working. We well, get Chris Eliopoulos to do it. You should. Yeah. Well, you can't get we can't Chris now, him. man. James but might be you should have you should have Chris come on here. You you'd be fascinated with Chris because he's a cartoonist. He? He's the cartoonist on our kids' books. Okay, but he has a totally different approach because everything that I say is all verbal, and his is all in drawing. He lives his whole life in drawing. It's a hard pictures. podcast, then. And no, no, but I'm saying when he talks about it, it's fascinating. Like he, he's just a he's an awesome guy. He'll, he, I think you'd really like him. So, Brad, will you come back on in November when your when your show comes on? Uh, if I'm here, of course. If you unless you're traveling to Florida, no, I should actually be here. So that'll be fun. Oh, I'll go to Florida. I like going to Florida in November. Yeah, we got a long time. No, no, I'm sorry. I don't know if they're going to fly me. I don't know what the PBS budget is. This isn't like a, it's a nonprofit, man. We can, you know, can't make big deals. Well, the first conspiracy, the secret plot to kill George Washington by Brad Meltzer and Josh Minch. And thanks so much for coming on the show. Thanks for having me and for supporting Josh too.
AI might be the most important new computer technology ever. It's storming every industry, and literally billions of dollars are being invested. So buckle up. The problem is that AI needs a lot of speed and processing power, so how do you compete without costs spiraling out of control? It's time to upgrade to the next generation of the cloud, Oracle Cloud Infrastructure, or OCI. OCI is a single platform for your infrastructure, database, application development, and AI needs. OCI has four to eight times the bandwidth of other clouds, offers one consistent price instead of variable regional pricing, and of course, nobody does data better than Oracle. So now you can train your AI models at twice the speed and less than half the cost of other clouds. If you want to do more and spend less, like Uber, 8x8, and Databricks Mosaic, take a free test drive of OCI at oracle.com slash advance. That's oracle.com slash advance. oracle.com slash advance.